morning, everyone. My name is Matt Kramer. I'm president of the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining us this morning for Breakfast with the Mayors. This has been a relatively new tradition the past five or six years, and it's one that I think emphasizes both the importance of the Twin Cities as a region, but also the distinct differences between the two cities in how we move ahead and how we work together and the opportunity to hear from the two mayors. About 10 years ago, the St. Paul Chamber had a breakfast with Mayor Chris Coleman in our former student union. And I remember looking around a dining room that morning and saying, there are 100 people here. Isn't this amazing? And then last year, uh, eventually the, uh, the chambers joined together. And then last year, we had 320 people at Town & Country. Today, we had 450 people register. So I, I think that's a sign of three things. One, um, the wisdom of the chambers in pulling their uh, organizations together to host this breakfast. Uh, two, the hard work of their staffs and boards uh, to get people to come. And three, the fact that we have, uh, in 2017, at least in our central cities, a in, in, uh, couple of elections that uh, will be almost as interesting as what we just went through in 2016. So I know how much everybody looks forward to hearing from the, the mayors in a little bit. Again, uh, welcome to St. Thomas. As anyone knows, you walk into a Target store and your intention is just to buy a gallon of milk. You walk out 20 minutes later with $150 worth of merchandise. I'd like to think, as Doug noted, we may have started at 100. We're at 450 today. Please join me in welcoming Thad Hellman from Target, who is going to explain how this event gets bigger every single year. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thanks, Matt, and good morning. Yeah, it's apparently the target magic that just kind of gets you uh, greater and greater every year. So uh, I want to make this pretty short and sweet because I'm pretty sure that uh, nobody here woke up this morning eagerly anticipating what I had to say. But I do want to, uh, to on behalf of Target, I do want to say that we are honored to be a sponsor of this event today that brings our two great cities together. Um, it's a remarkable event and one we look forward to um, every year. Uh, target is particularly proud of our home state and we have a very strong commitment to the Minneapolis and St. Paul region. It's very important to us. Whether it's the tens of thousands of people that we employ in the state, or if it's our recent support and uh, partnership with Thor Construction on the development of their new headquarters and office space uh, in North Minneapolis, that should be, yeah, that should be a, thank you, that should be a great catalyst for the revitalization of the North Side, to our support of, uh, higher ground in St. Paul that really should help provide some uh, support yep, to some of our neighbors who are most in need. And obviously we're proud to work and live in a region where civic and business leaders can come together to get things done and make our region a better place. And we take a lot of energy in knowing that everybody in this room is rooting for us, just like we're all rooting for each other. Because ultimately our collective success is gonna make our region stronger and it's gonna make it more vibrant. So, and speaking of rooting, uh, I do also want to point out, and hopefully many of you have heard, our newest major league team uh, will be sporting the Target logo front and center on their jerseys for their inaugural season when the Minnesota United take the field. So go United. <laughs> Woo! So we're particularly excited about that too, and as a soccer fan, I can't wait for the opening kickoff. So uh, that's all I'm gonna say for now, but thank you to the Minneapolis Chamber and the St. Paul Chamber for pulling this together. Mayors, thank you for being here. We're looking forward to what you have to say, and thank you all for attending, and have a great morning. Thanks. Good morning. My name's Ted Johnson. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for the Minnesota Timberwolves and the world champion Minnesota Lynx. Um, welcome. Um, we have sort of an interesting circumstance this year. I, I am the board chair of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce. And this year we have the distinction of having both chambers being led by sports teams. And so in an effort to propose some detente, Jeff, I just wanted to let you know that I won't bring up sort of blown two goal leads if you don't talk about fourth quarter collapses. <laughs> yeah? No? I would get the better end of that deal. Sorry. Um, so at any rate, very excited for this morning. Incredible crowd. And I think it really speaks to something. You know, this, this seems to be 
maybe the most politically dynamic environment that, that we've seen in a generation, if you look over the last six months, you certainly don't need to look more uh, than just the last seven days to sort of see how divided we seem to be as a community or as a society. And I think it really speaks to the power of institutions. And I think, uh, you know, we are the land of institutions. We seem to be the envy of many communities around the country with our strength of public and private institutions. And I think it really speaks to the power of the two chambers in being able to put events like this together, to bring people together, to have constructive conversations about how we move our community forward and maybe how we bridge the political divide. And so uh, I'd like to get things going. Um, we'd like to hear from our first speaker. Mayor Betsy Hodges is the 47th mayor of Minneapolis. In her role as mayor, she focuses on three very clear goals, running the city well, growing a great city, and increasing equity. Her priorities are ensuring that the city works well for everyone and that all people contribute to and benefit from the growth and prosperity of Minneapolis. Some of her major initiatives include her Cradle to K cabinet, creating a Zero Waste Minneapolis initiative, improving the police community relations, and helping small businesses thrive. Prior to becoming mayor in 2014, Betsy Hodges served on the Minneapolis City Council for eight years as a council member for more than 13. And maybe we can get her to tell us how she made Robert De Niro laugh or chuckle. But with that, uh, chamber members, please join me in welcoming Minneapolis Mayor Betsy Hodges. Well, good morning. It is nice to once again be in St. Paul. Once again be in St. Paul for the Joint Chamber <laughs> Breakfast. Uh, and thank you, Ted, for that introduction. It is always, honestly, a privilege to attend this breakfast and to share the stage uh, with my friend Chris Coleman, who you'll get to hear from. And I will say, though, I will mention, this is the third year in a row that the Joint Chamber Breakfast has been in St. Paul. <laughs> So, so I don't know where you are, Jonathan Weinhagen, but it's my first and greatest expectation of you. So we have a lot going on on our side of the river, so come visit. There really is a lot going on uh, uh, in Minneapolis. Let's see. In the last year, we opened the Downtown East Commons, a signature world-class park that has been a huge part of the transformation of our East Downtown. Uh, from a sea of surface parking lots to the hottest neighborhoods anywhere, $600 million of new investment and counting, and I am particularly proud to co-chair the Commons Fundraising Committee along with Pat Ryan of Ryan Companies that has gotten this space open and such a signature space for downtown Minneapolis. Uh, you will also start to see the refurbished PV Plaza at the south end of Nicollet Mall starting in 2018 around the time that Nicollet Mall reopens with a redesign that so many have participated in helping envision that will captivate the world the way that the original Lawrence Halpern design did 50 years ago. Uh, I walked the mall last fall to check in with uh, business owners and building managers about how construction is going for them. It's going about how you would think. It's been a struggle for some, but overall most are doing well and looking forward to the beautiful final product. And I did check with our Public Works Director yesterday. The project is still on time, as planned, and on budget. Also along Nicollet Mall will be the old Dayton's Macy's repurposed as a cutting-edge high-tech workspace and specialty retail that is well-suited for our new 21st century downtown Minneapolis. And I've been working closely and quietly with Macy's for months. Uh, this was something that we didn't want to have happen, but we could see the writing on the wall. And I'm glad the day uh, was a forward-looking day, that announcement, and hopeful rather than backward-looking and mournful. I'm very gratified that at a time when we had to announce the bad news of the closing, that we were able to announce a buyer whose strong track record aligns with the kind of retail that our downtown needs now in the 21st century, the kind of retail that I and many of us have been talking about for some time. And I'm convinced that we landed this great buyer in large measure because of our significant public-private investment in the redesign of Nicollet Mall, which we at the city of Minneapolis fought for for many years. Uh, investment in the public good 
uh, means uh, you can draw people who want to invest privately as well. And uh, when I talked to the new buyers, they did reaffirm that. And of course, when I say Nicollet Mall, what I mean to say is Super Bowl Boulevard, which is what it will be called about 53 weeks from now. I think everybody's ready. The countdown is on, uh, not just for us. I mean, we have a lot to do, and we will get that done. Uh, but the real countdown is on for the rest of the world who gets to discover our awesomeness and our winter awesomeness in Minneapolis and St. Paul and Bloomington and the region to boot as the Super Bowl is just about a year from now. And even before then, we get to reveal our awesomeness to the world when the X Games come for the first time this summer. So with all of this awesomeness happening in Minneapolis, it may come as no surprise that we just announced recently that for the fifth year in a row, the value of permitted construction in Minneapolis exceeded $1 billion. The fifth year in a row. And it may come as no surprise, we've kind of gotten used to Minneapolis's growth, but we shouldn't take it for granted. There are almost no cities in our part of the country and few anywhere in the country that can boast of the extended growth period that we continue to enjoy in Minneapolis. And when I talk to other mayors from around the country, it is part of the conversation that we have. How do we support, manage, extend the growth in our cities? And, and they ask that question. And those numbers are evidence of people's confidence in the future of a great city. A great city that is growing while prioritizing the investments in racial equity that expand economic growth for everyone, indeed upon which our future, future growth depends. So it, there's a lot of confidence in Minneapolis. The investment shows it. And thank you for that confidence, because many of you are the people investing in Minneapolis. So thank you for that. And all of it is a great thing. All of this growth is great. For some folks, almost too great because it comes with its own set of problems and challenges. They are fantastic problems to have. The problems of managing growth are fantastic problems to have. We worked incredibly hard for these problems and there's still problems and we still get to manage them. So that's why I funded more traffic control agents to help you drive through downtown uh, with a minimum of cursing at all the construction lane closures. You're very welcome. Uh, it's why I funded the hiring and training of expert assessors to make sure we're collecting every cent of revenue that we as a city are entitled to. That's good stewardship, but not a penny more. Also good stewardship. I know many of you pay those taxes, so thank you. And you're welcome for all the assessors. And that is why I have funded more health inspectors to make sure a diverse group of entrepreneurs know what they need to do to get and keep their restaurant licenses. It's why we continue to invest in redesigning our streets to better accommodate pedestrians, bikes, and transit, as well as cars. And that's why to respond to this growth, I've increased the sworn complement of the fire department for the first time in many years. There's more people, there's more stuff going on, there's more calls, there's more runs. There's more firefighters. And this is the right moment to talk about something else that I'm hugely proud of in Minneapolis. It falls into the bucket of managing growth, but it falls into the bucket of future growth and what fundamentally people love about our city, about our cities. In 2016, the city council, the park board, and I reached a landmark agreement to fund the infrastructure and operations of our neighborhood parks and our streets for the next 20 years. We did it with a focus on transparency and on equity. And this is the kind of investment in the fundamental services that make Minneapolis a good place for business. After all, our top rated parks are a huge recruiting tool for our city. I know that that's true from having talked to our partners at Greater MSP, from having talked to our partners at all the economic development agencies. And you can't get to a park much less your job or your business without a good street to take you there. These are important investments. And I cannot stress enough the historic nature of this agreement. For many years, we knew the tipping point was coming where our parks and streets would be astronomically more expensive to repair, if not beyond repair. And we responded by investing in our streets and parks so that future generations can also enjoy our city's most basic infrastructure. And that, is the kind of coming together across jurisdictions for the common good that we still do in Minneapolis 
and that our state and our country get to do a lot more of into the future. So in addition to managing our current growth, we are investing in our future growth, and a big chunk of that future growth is based in small business and in entrepreneurship. The success story of our city is rooted in the genius and entrepreneurial spirit that brought every one of you to this room, and that lives on today in thousands of small business owners across Minneapolis. The next Dayton's or Target or 3M or Medtronic is out there in Minneapolis right now and investing in their future means investing in all of our futures. We're doing it in a variety of ways since 2004. My Business Made Simple initiative is doing away with unnecessary barriers that get in the way for everyone of their investment in the city of Minneapolis, but they especially get in the way those barriers of the success for, you know, for immigrants, for women, for people of color all these entrepreneurs, we have made it hard for people to invest and we should be making it easy and that's what Business Made Simple is about. Our Bloomberg Mayor's Innovation Team is working on innovative ways to promote investment in small business to make sure that people are successful. We are doing a top to bottom review of the city's own procurement practices with the goal of buying f more from local small businesses whenever possible. And in direct uh, response to an often heard request from the small business community, we just added a new team of small business navigators. And the goal of these folks will be not just to help entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs figure out the next step toward opening or expanding a business, although it is that, it will ultimately be to put the navigators out of business by making city systems so transparent and legible from the outset that a navigator isn't necessary, that you don't need someone guiding you through the city processes because they are set up for you to get through easily and well. And this is all part of what I call a get to yes city. It means that even when our regulators first have to tell an entrepreneur no, you know, no the grease trap can't go there, it has to go here, or whatever it is, the question, the next question out of our mouths at the city gets to be, and how can we help you get to yes? How can we help you solve the problem? How can we facilitate this investment that you wanna make? And that's a transformation in the way that we do business that I am very excited to lead. And finally, we've invested in our future growth by passing our Earn Sick and Safe Time Ordinance last year, just as St. Paul has. Our future growth must be equitable growth or it will not be sustainable. And the lack of access to earned sick time for more than 40% of Minneapolis workers was a racial and gender equity issue. And it's why I first proposed it as a solution two years ago. And with the passage of the ordinance and our authority to pass it upheld last week, now no one who works in Minneapolis has to choose between getting well and getting paid. Both our cities passing it is a strong step forward to a sustainable, healthy, and equitable regional economy but we are also making investments in the city to make sure there is the long and appropriate runway for business and entrepreneurs in the city to enact this in a way that makes sense for them and their employees. Before I conclude today, I wanna to touch on a couple of subjects that I'm pretty sure are on a lot of people's minds here today, minimum wage and public safety. And I want to be clear with you, as I have been clear with everybody that I've talked to, whomever I've talked to, I still believe that Minneapolis shouldn't go it alone on minimum wage. Not because a higher minimum wage is bad, it's not, and I support it now as I always have. Not even that it's bad for business. History shows us that when it is thoughtfully and uniformly applied with an adequate runway, it is not bad for business. I still believe in an increased minimum wage. But rather, Minneapolis shouldn't go it alone because Minneapolis is part of this greater regional economy and because I don't believe we should work, leave any worker behind. So the reality is, is that Minneapolis is going to go it alone. Uh, like it or not, um, there is enough support on the city council to raise a Minneapolis-only minimum wage. And if Minneapolis is going it alone, I need to be at that table. I need to be there to make sure that what we do pass is sensible and sustainable. I need to be at the table to make sure that what we do pass doesn't leave some classes of workers behind. And I need to be at the table to make sure that what we do pass is a firm step toward a region-wide uniform wage policy. Uniformity and reliability are good for everybody, workers, consumers, and businesses. When it comes to how we're handling public safety, let me tell you about two things that I did 
just yesterday. First, Chief Harteau and I met the media for our annual press conference to review the last year in public safety in Minneapolis and talk about the challenges and solutions ahead of us. There was significant good news, believe it or not. Homicides fell 20%, bucking a national trend, and burglary is at a 36-year low. One of the biggest concerns we had a few years ago, we are now at a 36-year low. And there has been much hard work on the part of our officers to get these results, and I am truly, truly grateful for the MPD and the work they've done to get these results in the city. Our major challenge is that shootings are up around the city. Many of these shootings are perpetrated by a relatively small number of people who cycle in and out of acts of violence and retribution, but the consequences of their actions are deadly and tear families and communities apart. This violence has no place in any neighborhood in our city, including downtown, none. One of the things I did yesterday is I stood with Celicia Beeks as she found out and as we announced that we had found the person and arrested and charged the person who had killed her mother, who was shot in crossfire on her way to drop off her daughter uh, at an event. I am so glad we found an answer to her question. And it is completely unacceptable that there was a question to be asked in the first place as to who killed her mother. To solve this challenge, and in the continued shameful absence of any steps to curb gun violence at the state and federal level, we are not only continuing to enforce the law, and I will be clear, we are enforcing the law. Chief Harteau and I are clear as can be that our officers need to do the work of law enforcement. But we are doing much more in addition to that because it will take more than that to reduce violent crime. More community policing with more police officers. I've increased the authorized strength of our department by 27 officers in the last three years in order to build real relationships of trust in the community. You'll see stats that say our traffic stops are down. That is true because the officers are actually out of the cars walking a beat and it is hard for them to stop a car while they're on foot. Group violence intervention to surround potential offenders with real options for leaving violence behind, being clear about the consequences if they do not. GVI strategies have worked in other cities to reduce violent crime by about up to 60%. I could go on about GVI, but it's when community-led, community members come together with law enforcement and uh, government officials to sit down with people that we know are most likely to commit the next shootings. Not people who've already been arrested, but people that we know are most likely to be the victim or perpetrator of the next shooting, and we have this conversation with them. If you want to change your life, we will help you. If you do not accept this help, if you do not put your life on another path, the consequences, the natural consequences of your actions are going to fall upon you very hard. That is GVI, and we are investing a great deal in it, and it has worked in other cities. And we are investing in collaborations where community gets to decide how they choose to intervene to keep their neighborhood safe on the ground, and then the city will invest in the strategies that they choose. This body of work is shifting the center of gravity of public safety in Minneapolis in a way that no other city in America is doing. Public safety, uh, with the possible exception of St. Paul. No, public safety is no longer just about law enforcement in Minneapolis, though that is crucial. If we're going to reduce violent crime, we have to see public safety as law enforcement plus the community. There's only so far we're going to get with law enforcement alone. But there's a lot further we can get when law enforcement and community are working together on behalf of public safety. So we had that press conference. And when we left that press conference, Jonathan Weinhagen and I went to my office, where we together co-chaired a meeting of key downtown stakeholders, business leaders, police, city and county officials, to address the reality and perceptions of safety in downtown Minneapolis. From that very honest exchange of ideas and perspectives, we are developing a solid plan to address, in particular, the behaviors on Hennepin Avenue during the daytime, like catcalling and drunkenness. These behaviors, while often not illegal, have been undermining our shared goal of keeping downtown a neighborhood where everyone 
feels safe, everyone feels welcome. And we are also aiming to set and enroll people in standards of public behavior downtown that can and will be broadly shared for the benefit of everyone. The plan we are developing to address and redirect these daytime behaviors will be ready to go April 1st. And this work will complement the law enforcement and community policing that our officers are doing to address the issues of nighttime violence between 12 and 4 a.m. on weekends in particular, in addition to all of our city departments that are part of our nighttime mobility management plan to deal with bar clothes, that 12 to 4 a.m. Different set of issues from 12 to 4 as there are during the day, and we have plans to address each of them. And to the St. Paul Chamber, I have a particular thank you for giving up Jonathan Weinhagen to Minneapolis, right? Let's, let's, let's talk about how great Jonathan is. He has been an honest broker and an excellent partner in just the few months that he's been at the Minneapolis Chamber, and I look forward to a productive collaboration with him and the Chamber, not least on behalf of downtown safety. So as mayor, I expend the large majority of my time and effort on two things, economic growth and public safety, and sometimes and often on the nexus of the two. I am proud of what we have accomplished so far, what we're doing now, and what's yet to come in building a safe city and a vibrant economy that will sustain and expand Minneapolis's growth for years to come. People say, show, don't tell. People say, show your work, don't tell people what you're gonna do, just show them what you're gonna do. So I hope that from the descriptions I've given today that it's clear that what I've done and I'm doing to support growth and business and the Minneapolis economy, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity for anybody who's confused, I'm grateful for the opportunity to show that work and to tell about the work that I've been doing for anyone's left confused about whether or not I value business, I support business, and I understand deeply that business is crucial to the success of the city of Minneapolis and everything else that we choose to do. So I'm grateful for the many business leaders in this room here right now and the opportunity to talk with you. I am grateful for the many people in this room who have served as advisors and guides for me, uh, whether it's criticism, plain old criticism or constructive criticism, it has been a guide to me over the last three years and I'm grateful for it. You have made Minneapolis a stronger city. You have made me a stronger mayor and I appreciate that. And I love being mayor of Minneapolis. It's the best job I've ever had, for sure, and I intend to do it for a good while yet, but I must confess that one thing uh, that is a challenge right now, and something that I'm not particularly loving about being mayor right now, is that this is the last time I will share this stage with Chris Coleman as mayor of Minneapolis, as St. Paul, as mayor of St. Paul. <laughs> Me as mayor of Minneapolis, you as mayor of St. Paul. See, I was all sincere and then I messed it up like that. I think that's pretty typical. Now, here's what's supposed to happen right now. I'm supposed to make some really clever dry remarks about Chris and I'm supposed to nudge him a little bit and you know, whatever it is. And we do that a lot actually because we've been friends a long time. But I have to say, I, don't, I can't bring myself to do it today. I am almost desperately sincere in my appreciation of Chris Coleman and our friendship for many years, since long before I became mayor, we've become even better friends since then. Through thick and thin, Chris has stood with me with a sympathetic ear, and yes, that sense of humor. Thank God for the sense of humor. Uh, Chris is an outstanding leader, an outstanding mayor. St. Paul and our entire region have been lucky to have him on the job uh, for all these years, and I am a better mayor and a better person for your friendship, honest. And both of our cities are stronger because of the genuine partnership between us. So I know I'm supposed to make jokes, but I'm really just that sincere about how great Chris is. Can we give him a round of applause? <laughs> I am sure you will find a way to get retribution for that sincerity, Chris. Um, those are my remarks for this morning. I am deeply grateful for the opportunity uh, to be here with you, to talk about what's happening in our cities, and to be the mayor of Minneapolis. And I'm deeply grateful for everything each and every person in this room does to make sure that Minneapolis and our entire region is thriving. Thank you. How do I follow that up? Um, 
I'm Jeff Pellegrum. I am uh, uh, the CFO of the Minnesota Wild, and I'm the new, uh, the brand new uh, chair of the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce. And my job is to introduce uh, Chris Coleman to the stage. Um, Betsy already did a lot of that uh, for me. Um, so I'll just tell you a couple things that I know about Chris uh, personally. First of all, I know Chris has soul because he is um, maybe tied with John Maher of our organization as the biggest Bruce Springsteen fan on the planet. And uh, he's a huge, huge Bruce fan. I don't think Bruce would be offended by my juxtaposition of that. But um, second of all, I know he's got spirit. He is a gigantic Wild fan, which I personally very much appreciate. Uh, when he... Uh, when we weren't very good, he gave his advice on how we could get better, and when we are good as we are today, he still gives us plenty of advice on how we can get better. I know he's grounded in St. Paul. I mean, after three terms as mayor, 12 years, prior to that, he was uh, representing St. Paul in the city council. He has got deep, deep St. Paul roots, and uh, I very much appreciate that. And lastly, I know he's a little bit crazy. He's a little, he's a little out there. He. Uh, I think he's done the crashed ice course about five times, is that correct? And am I correct to say that you're gonna go do it again this year? And if you need any more evidence that he's a little nuts, I've heard he might be running for governor. So please help me in uh, welcoming Chris Coleman. Well, thank you, Jeff. The, uh, it's great to be here, and uh, uh, I just have to throw out my best material since Betsy was so nice to me. Uh, I have, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the nice thing about mayors is uh, when you get together, uh, very few people truly understand the challenges that major mayors face other than other mayors. And uh, recently, uh, we have included in our little group Mayor Larson from Duluth, who's uh, doing a fantastic job up in our, our wonderful city to the north. And so we kind of exchanged, you know, what is it like from a person who's been around for almost 12 years? What's it like from a, a person who's been around for four years? And what's it like from a perspective of a fairly new mayor? And so we've shared stories and shared challenges. Uh, last night we were exchanging the, uh, some of the challenges that we faced this last year. Uh, and, uh, you know, with some of the protests that we've seen uh, over this last year, uh, some of them decided to pay a visit to Mayor Hodges in the middle of the night. Uh, just to have a conversation with her, and, and uh, uh, Mayor Larson shared with us that she lives in a place called Pajuli Ridge, uh, which I didn't know existed, and I really am kind of curious to go find out what exactly that's all about up in Duluth. Uh, but I shared with them the story that after, the, after some folks had showed up at uh, Mayor Hodges' house, my daughter called us from New York, and she says, for the love of God, could somebody please go up to my room and remove the high school musical poster just in case protesters show up at our house? <laughs> Well, it's, uh, it, it's great to be here, and, and I want to thank uh, Matt and uh, Jonathan for sponsoring this and being a part of it. Uh, Matt, I think that you have not fully embraced the spirit of 2017, because as I look out over this crowd, I see at least 300,000 people. Uh, and, uh, we, I don't care what anybody else says. I also get confused frequently for Tom Cruise, and uh, I, I love alternative facts. Uh, and uh, you know, it's uh, after doing this breakfast for as many years as we we have done it, I finally have gotten my wife Connie to come out and uh, be with us this morning, and uh, appreciate the fact that she thought, well, it, it, it's your last chance to to uh, do this breakfast, so maybe I'll come out this morning. So thank you, for Connie, for being with us. Uh, the, you know, I am, a, I, I am an unabashed uh, Wild fan, and, and, and there was just one tweet that if I could take back, it was after kind of a devastating playoff loss, I might have used three initials that begin with W and end with F, uh, with a T in the middle. Um, and I thought, well, you know, I, I do get to be a passionate fan. I mean, that is, that, that is the Minnesota way. And, uh, and I do enjoy it, but it, I, I gotta tell you, it has been really fun to, uh, to watch what the Wild has been doing this last, this last uh, season. Uh, unbelievable run, uh, we're, we're so strong, I'm very confident about this. Although Jeff was pointing out, he said, you know, that it's a great thing that United is doing 
uh, this uh, sponsorship with Target, and we thank Target so much for, for being a part of this. This is a huge deal. Uh, but he said, you know, having a red Target on the back of a hockey jersey would probably not be a good idea. So uh, thanks, Jeff, for thinking of, of how to protect our players. Um, it is uh, this, at the, at the end of the year, you know, you get those questions. What do you hope for the New Year's? What's your resolution or what's your, what's your wish? And I said, uh, you know, most politicians say, well, world peace, you know, we want world peace in the coming year. Or they say, you know, we want all of our children to be successful. And I said, I want the Wild to win uh, the Stanley Cup. Um, and I thought that was a reasonable thing. But people, people pointed out that that might be a little shallow. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I thought, well, I would like world peace to be started because the Wild win the <laughs> Stanley Cup. So we're, we're getting close to the, the winning the Stanley Cup part. Hopefully that will lead to the world peace that we're looking at. Uh, let me just start off by saying that, first of all, my thoughts are with the governor this morning. Uh, that was a scary moment for all of us. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter what side of the political divide you're on. Uh, the governor has been a strong leader for the state of Minnesota, uh, and we hope that he has a speedy recovery and that he gets back in. The session is a, is a very difficult thing on, on everybody. Uh, that's a long road ahead, and we need, uh, we need all of our leaders to be strong, and so we wish the governor a speedy recovery. Um, And I'd be re remiss if I didn't uh, mention that when I walked into this room, uh, it was very diff difficult to come into this breakfast and not have Todd Klingel uh, be with us this morning. Uh, and in the spirit of that great leader of this organization of the Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce, I just want to say uh, we, we do truly miss Todd and his leadership. Uh, we're happy that Jonathan has been able to step in. But Mayor Hodges, if you think for a second that having uh, Matt Kramer and the former employee of the St. Paul Chamber of Commerce is ever going to lead to this breakfast being in Minneapolis. Forget it. It's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, I, you know, this, this last, this last uh, you know, I, as I think about my last term, my last year in office as mayor of the city of St. Paul, uh, you do start to kind of look back in nostalgia. You start to think back about how far we have come. Uh, this breakfast when Mayor Rybeck and I first did it, uh, the two cities were at a very di different place, not only as they are today, but as they were compared to each other. Uh, you know, we, we talked a lot about the Twin Cities, but the Twin Cities were very different, uh, and uh, Minneapolis, though not as strong as it is today, uh, was certainly much in a, in a stronger position than the city of St. Paul was. Um, and so that whole concept of regionalism was, was a little fresh. Uh, we hadn't really figured out what that looked like. We were still in the process of, of thinking about, you know, what if it, what would happen if, actually if Minneapolis and St. Paul af, uh, actually started working together. And so over the last decade, we really have started to work much closely, uh, much more closely together on a lot of issues. We've started thinking about everything from transit lines to how we can partner on bringing the Super Bowl to the state of Minnesota and to the Twin Cities. Uh, we have come a long ways as it, as, uh, with regards to regionalism. But sometimes what happens when you kind of get to a point, you forget why it is that you got there or you started down that road in the first place. And so one of the things I want to kind of leave you with here today is that regionalism still matters. Regionalism is still absolutely critical. Uh, and that we cannot, uh, because we have come so far and because our cities are doing well, get back to the point where we now start competing against each other uh, and we start stop thinking about it from a, from a more uh, kind of a holistic perspective about why this region is as strong as it is. And so as we think about how we invest, where we invest, how we partner together to get things done, uh, I just want to say that I hope that the legacy of the work that I've done as mayor is truly to embed regionalism uh, as a defining concept of this Twin Cities area. Because if we don't do that, uh, if we don't understand that our competition is not each other, but it is the Denvers and the Dallases and the Portlands and other communities, not just in the United States, but across the globe, uh, then we're going to suffer. And so I hope that we continue that work together on behalf of, of all of our communities in the Twin Cities region and, quite frankly, across the state of Minnesota. Now, that is, last one is an asterisk because I am running for governor, and so now I have to finish every sentence with, and the state of Minnesota. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it, it isn't, uh, you think back uh, how far we have come over these last, uh, these last dozen years. You know, St. Paul is as strong as it has ever been in my lifetime. Uh, even George Latimer admits to that. Uh, he doesn't like to admit to it, but 
he says, damn it, Coleman, I can't even argue with you anymore. Uh, but when you look at the vibrancy of the lower town area, if you look at what's happening in, 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 in every corner of the city, uh, if you look at not only what has occurred already, but what is about to occur, uh, and where we're going to take off, it is really exciting to think about the future of the city of St. Paul. Uh, and so I look back at, at what we have accomplished, but I think about this next year and what we need to do uh, as I finish out my term. There certainly are some key areas that I want to focus in on, uh, not the least of which is making sure that the, uh, the soccer stadium is off to a successful start. Construction will begin in earnest in a couple of months. Uh, the work that we're doing in partnership with RK Midway and all the business owners up in, that, in the Midway Shopping Center, uh, looking out at that whole area as to what can happen. We need to make sure that that project is a, it has the catalytic effect that I know it can have if we do it right and if we work in conjunction with all to make that successful. The work that we've done around the Ford site has been tremendous. Uh, it has been a long time in coming. Uh, I certainly don't think that in, uh, in the fall of 2005, shortly after I got elected, and when it was first announced that Ford was uh, looking at closing that facility, uh, I didn't imagine that almost 12 years later I'd still be standing here going, any day now we'll start construction on, on a new phase of what the Ford site looks like. But what that interim period has allowed us to do is to be extremely thoughtful, extremely thoughtful about how it is that we want that site to develop, about how we can maximize the opportunity, how we can do something kind of to take advantage of what the, uh, the future development in 2017, 2018, and beyond looks like as opposed to building to what uh, the city of St. Paul looked like in 1950 or 1960 or 70. Uh, in our planning department, led by uh, Jonathan Sage Martinson, uh, Cecile Bedore before him, uh, his incredible staff, uh, has done an amazing job of mapping out the future for that site. And so even though I may not cut a ribbon as mayor on that site, I am firmly uh, uh, of the opinion uh, that we are going to create one of the most important developments, not just in the state of Minnesota, notice that asterisk, um, <laughs> not just in this region, but really across the country and across the globe. We are going to seize that moment and we are going to make something really spectacular on that site. Um, we still have a lot of work to do uh, on jobs. That is one of the things that we focused in on, council member. Uh, Chris Tobert and I have begun uh, really bringing in people from the creative economies to talk about how we can do things differently to make sure that we are creating uh, destinations for people that want to work in the city of St. Paul, uh, creating opportunities and the platform for, uh, for businesses to be successful, not just in Lower Town, but really across the city of St. Paul, particularly across the transit corridors. Uh, and we want to make sure that we have a jobs, jobs, jobs focus. Uh, because we know that St. Paul can't just be the bedroom community to Minneapolis. It has to be a thriving business center as well. And in that, we need to make sure that we're focused in on businesses. We need to make sure that we are doing what we can to be supportive of you. I think Mayor Hodges is, um, has described it very well, that there will be times where regulation is appropriate. We have to do, uh, that is the business that we're in. But as we think about regulation, how is it that we can not only just increase the burden, but really ease the burden, focusing on some of the things that matter, and go back and start eliminating some of those regulations that we've had that have built up. Uh, regulation shouldn't be like uh, layers of sediment that just continue to build up on top of each other, but we really need to go in and clear out some of the old regulations as we start thinking about what we need to do today uh, to make it easier and streamline processes for business. That's creating uh, ambassadors in our, in our departments to make sure that our businesses have assistance as they kind of look to, to go uh, to build a new business or to expand, uh, streamlining all the permitting processes that we can, do whatever that we, we can uh, on behalf of our businesses to help them thrive and to understand that, uh, that we can't talk about good jobs unless we support the businesses that are actually providing those good jobs for our residents. And before I, I close and we turn it open for questions, uh, I want to say that uh, of the work that I've done that I'm prou proudest of, <clears throat> but know that we have done the, uh, not enough on, is the issue of equity. Uh, the issue of creating a community that is open and welcome for all, the, the, a community that creates opportunities for all, where no matter who you are, no matter where you were born, uh, no matter your race, race or ethnicity, no matter where, what part of the globe you came from or whether you were born in the city of St. Paul, that you had the same opportunities to be successful in the city as I had as a kid growing up uh, off of West 7th Street and throughout the city of St. Paul. The work continues, but I, I am convinced that we have an amazing community that has come together to figure out how we can be helpful. All of your businesses that have supported the Right Track po program, 
uh, are an important step to giving our kids a future opportunity. All of your businesses that have created, that have supported the ambassadors program in downtown to give alternatives for us to, to reduce crime and get our kids directed in a positive path. Uh, it is, it is, uh, we've come so far, we have so much further to go, uh, but I know that all of us that are committed to a strong and vibrant future for the city of St. Paul, this Twin Cities region, uh, and the state of Minnesota, Pastor, uh, it, it, the fact of the matter is um, when we work together, when we recognize that we have a mutual self-interest in solving some of these challenges, uh, we will be able to, uh, to solve this very, very pressing problem, uh, this very difficult problem to solve. I know, uh, as uh, it used to be said, I think Bill Clinton used to say, there's nothing right, wrong with uh, Minnesota, to paraphrase him, nothing wrong with Minnesota that can't be fixed by what is right with Minnesota. And I, and I truly believe that the solutions to our problems lie not just in this room, uh, but across this region. So I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank you all for being a part of this incredible community. Uh, it has been my amazing honor to be a part of this for the last, uh, last 11 plus years uh, and before that on the city council. Uh, but I always say I want to thank you not just as the mayor of the city of St. Paul, but as a kid who grew up in the city of St. Paul, believes in the future of the city of St. Paul, uh, and truly believes this is one of the greatest communities in the country. Thank you all for being a part of it. All right, we're going to do a little bit of Q&A, so I would invite Mayor Hodges back up to the stage. And Christine and I will be taking questions. So any questions for the mayors? This is not a shy room. Hi, Peter McDermott from MDI. I congratulate you for working together and, and bringing our communities together. Actually, some time ago I was told there wasn't a geographic area at Twin Cities, uh, but I think there really is, and, and, and you guys have, have brought it together. Could you just comment on uh, your positions on the greater uh, MSP uh, and the funding of that organization? I mean, as a regional organization, and uh, we need to promote it that way, I believe, and, and, and statewide also, for that matter. I'm happy to take that question about funding because I have a feeling I know where it comes from. Uh, I am a huge supporter of Greater MSP and have been since the concept was put, on, put before me as a council member in Minneapolis. Um, the idea that one of our biggest challenges as a region is not that we aren't awesome, we are awesome, but that no one knows it uh, is pretty commonsensical and that if we come together as a region to promote ourselves to show the world how great we are and what we have to offer, that rising tide will lift all boats in our region. That has been uh, my experience with Greater MSP as a board member. That has been uh, my belief about Greater MSP, and that is what the numbers bear out when you take a look at them. And so I uh, objected strenuously to the city council trying to take away the entirety of Greater MSP funding. Uh, from many, you know, the Minneapolis funding of Greater MSP. I see Michael Langley sitting here. We were uh, talking a, a great deal before that vote took place. I'm glad that, uh, and in the end, what we were able to do was retain at least some funding um, for Greater MSP this year so that we could make the case uh, for the value of the organization to council members who at the moment don't see it and uh, continue to work at the table together because Greater MSP is doing amazing things for the city of Minneapolis, let alone for the region. And I just kind of go back to, to my earlier remarks, which is sometimes when you get so far down the road, you kind of forget where the journey began. Uh, the, the birth story of Greater MSP was when Medtronic was looking to expand, uh, and we were not on Medtronic's site selector's radar uh, for a location for them to expand in. Not because they had looked at us and decided that it wasn't the right fit, but they literally didn't look at the Twin Cities area as a potential for expansion of a company whose headquarters is in the Twin Cities. And so, uh, you know, it is, it is not just one organization, it is the partnership. Uh, I have never seen, uh, and Michael Langley is here, I can't, I, I'm sure can confirm these numbers, but the, the relationship of the private investment that's going into that organization relative to the public investment uh, is extraordinary. I think it's great for council members to ask the question. Uh, I think it's an important question for all of us to be asking whenever you're spending public resources. Uh, but I think when you ask that question and you look at the value and you put it in the perspective of that regional, uh, that regional perspective, 
um, then there's no question that the value is strong and we need to continue to support that organization. We probably have time for one more question. One more. And we can't even get one more. I want to thank both of you uh, for being here. Excellent presentations. Uh, my question involves sanctuary cities. My understanding is that both St. Paul and Minneapolis are sanctuary cities. Are you going to continue that commitment uh, given our now new administration. Uh, what Minneapolis has is a separation ordinance, meaning since 2003 we've had on the books that our police officers do not ask people who call uh, or whom they encounter uh, their immigration status. We need everybody in the city of Minneapolis to feel safe calling the police. We don't want victims of crime or witnesses of crime to think that they cannot talk to our police officers because they'll get a question about their immigration status. It's public safety 101, and it's what we've been having a much larger national conversation about around communities that don't feel safe calling the police, and this is part of it. Uh, I don't use the phrase sanctuary city, although I understand what people mean by it, because I also, you know, I want to be clear, that's what we have is we have a separation ordinance. Um, that said, I will stand and fight for the people who live in Minneapolis, for the people who come to Minneapolis, with every breath I've got. And if uh, somebody wants to come and, you know, you know, round up immigrant folks and do all that sort of stuff, they're gonna have to come through me. I would just share that, uh, first of all, that, that term is, uh, is a little bit of a, um, it confuses folks because we do have a separation ordinance also in the city of St. Paul. Uh, it is, that is, and I think people think, well, that's just driven by those crazy liberals in the, in the cities. It was actually driven by law enforcement. Law enforcement is the one, if, you know, when you go up to the Capitol and this issue comes up before a legislative body, the first people up there that are, are testifying on behalf of, this, of, the or, of the ordinance that we have in Minneapolis or St. Paul is our police chiefs who are saying, we can't do our job. We can't reach in. I mean, think about in the Somali community, uh, the importance of building relationships in that community. Uh, if everybody that the police officers want to talk to in the Somali community have to worry about whether the first question they're going to be asked is, is what their immigration status is, uh, then, then it, uh, it is going to break down communication at a time where we need to be building up communication uh, in the community. And second of all, it really allows, it, you know, when you don't have that, then, then people start to get targeted and I think it leads down a path that you don't want to go. And so I, I think, I, I wrote an editorial a couple of, uh, a few weeks back uh, that was in the St. Paul paper that really outlined our position. You know, we still cooperate with, uh, with the, the federal agencies. Uh, we are not breaking the law. We are cooperating with the law, but we are distinguishing but between the public safety role that our St. Paul Police Department fulfills versus the duties of other agencies. Thank you. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Mayor Coleman and Mayor Hodges both for being here today and for all of the work that they do in partnership with the business community throughout the year.